Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Council Member Cabrera, Perkins, Rosenthal, and Torres. Oh, Jamani just came in? And Williams. We're here to hold a vote and hear testimony on several resolutions which will call upon the New York State Legislature to take action on rent reform. The first two resolutions sponsored by myself would call on the state to repeal vacancy decontrol and vacancy bonus. The next four resolutions are sponsored by Speaker Johnson. The first calls on the state to limit rent increases on the renewal of rent stabilized units where a preferential rent was being charged. The second request that the state make the major capital improvement rent increase a temporary surcharge. The third calls on the state to repeal Erdstat and allow New York City to regulate residential rents. And the final resolution sponsored by, speak, by the speaker would call on the state to extend the statute of limitations for rent overcharges. The next resolution sponsored by Council Member Rivera would call on the state to extend rent stabilization to unregulated apartments. The final resolution is sponsored by Council Member Powers and would call on the state to provide rent control tenants relief from high rent increases. Uh, is Council Member Rivera here? So we are going to call our first panel to give testimony, uh, Re Rebecca Nieves, Michael McKee, Kathy Wakeham, Susan Steinberg. Good morning. When everyone's settled, you can begin your testimonies. Just please identify yourself. Mike, you know us ladies first. I saw you. Good morning. My name is Michael McKee. I'm the treasurer of the Tenants Political Action Committee. I'm also a board member of the Met Council on Housing, the Citywide Tenants Union, and I'm a member of the Real Rent Reform Campaign, a lobbying group that represents uh, local community groups throughout the city and suburban, suburban counties. Tennis PAC supports the various resolutions calling on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign several bills to close loopholes on our rent protection laws and to strengthen rent and eviction protections. Because New York City lacks home rule power over rents and evictions, we must look to Albany to fix our broken rent laws. And for the last 25 years, we have beaten our heads against a brick wall. Tennis PAC urges you to include a resolution in support of S6828 A8409A, which is necessary to prevent the eviction of hundreds of loft tenants, most of them in northern Brooklyn, and I'm sure Council Member Levin would be happy to sponsor such a resolution. And I want to point out to you about the vacancy decontrol bill. It not only repeals vacancy deregulation going forward, it re-regulates the deregulated units that we have lost or at least 98% of them, which is a very important provision. These measures should have been enacted years ago, but Governor Andrew Cuomo has refused to support any of them for the last seven and a half years. Now that he has had an election year conversion, his minions claim that he wants to repeal vacancy deregulation and to make major capital improvement rent increases temporary surcharges. In addition to an indifferent governor, beholden to the real estate developers who have poured millions of dollars into his campaign coffers, the Republicans who control the state Senate, and the rogue Democrats who empower the Republicans have stopped any of these bills from coming to the floor. The state assembly passes these and other pro-tenant bills every year, or every other year, and everyone in Albany understands that they are one house bills. But the assembly has failed to use any real leverage to force the governor and Senate to enact them. Tenants are encouraged by statements from Speaker Corey Johnson, beginning at his inauguration on January 28th, that he intends to use his bully pulpit to help us put pressure on Albany to act on these bills. Other speakers have supported stronger rent protections, but none has made this fight a daily priority until now. We are very grateful to the speaker. The gutting of our rent protection laws over the last two and a half decades has been the major contributor to the disastrous affordability crisis we are now experiencing, not only in the city, but in the suburban counties as well. 
Some of you will be surprised to hear this next part of my testimony. We should never forget that it was not the Republicans in Albany who did the first real damage, but in fact the Democrats in the New York City Council who set the stage for our current crisis. In 1994, when the city rent laws were up for renewal for three more years, Speaker Peter Vallone, who was seeking real estate support to run for mayor, was able to cobble together 28 votes to enact permanent vacancy deregulation and permanent high income deregulation. State law allows the city to weaken the rent laws, but not to strengthen them. One by one, Democratic members of the council from Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx told tenant advocates, quote, I don't have any apartments in my district renting for $2,000 a month, so this bill will not affect my constituents, close quote. Verbatim, they all said exactly the same thing. We replied that if they passed this bill, monthly rents of $2,000 would become common all over the city. Of course, we were right and they were wrong, but the damage was done and now can only be done done by Albany. In 1997, the state legislature and Governor George Pataki incorporated these deregulation amendments into state law, thus preempting the city from altering them and expanded the two deregulation mechanisms to the suburban counties. We have lost hundreds of thousands of affordable units since these amendments became law. We look forward to working with Speaker Corey Johnson and other members of the City Council to restore our rent laws. We hope that all of you will participate in this fight. For starters, each one of you can organize one or more town hall meetings in your districts to activate and mobilize tenants to apply pressure to Albany. And you can help pay for buses to Albany next year when the state rent and co-op laws once again come up for renewal. Thank you very much. I am Rebecca Nieves, and I'm representing the Office of Assembly Member Harvey Epstein. We are in support of all resolutions proposed today. Assembly Member Epstein represents the east side of Manhattan, including the neighborhoods of the Lower East Side, East Village, Alphabet City, Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, Murray Hill, Tudor City, and the United Nations. Protecting tenants' rights and preserving affordable housing has been a priority for Assembly Member Epstein before he took office. His work towards a more affordable New York City will not waver. Assembly District 74 has seen innumerable changes and hardships regarding its housing. For example, 40% of occupied rent stabilized units in the zip code of 1009 alone are apartments with preferential rents. That is about 5,500 homes at risk of rents being hiked up to the legal maximum when leases are up for renewal. In one zip code alone, in District 74, we run the risk of displacing and vacating over 5,000 homes. With vacancies come bonuses and decontrol that makes it increasingly hard for people to stay in New York. By continuing to prevent New York City from regulating residential rents, the problem will only be exacerbated. It is imperative that New York City can enact regulations and work with the state legislature to protect tenants and ensure we are working towards making New York more affordable for everyone. Once again, I am Rebecca Nieves, representing the Office of Assemblymember Harvey Epstein, and we are in support of these resolutions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Oh, good morning. My name is Kathleen Wakeham. I represent Metropolitan Council on Housing. As a rent-stabilized tenant for over 40 years, I am in support of all the resolutions presented today. And I would like to speak about MCIs and the vacancy bonus and decontrol. Tenants are rent burdened because of rent increases, fees, MCIs, and other surcharges. According to the Coalition Against Tenant Harassment and the Association for Neighborhood Housing and Development, in Community Board 3, which includes Chinatown and the Lower East Side where I live, the median household income is 42,268. Here, over 50% of tenants are rent burdened. The recent Rent Guidelines Board study states that citywide tenants' incomes have remained stagnant for the fourth consecutive year while landlords' profits are 43%. The vacancy decontrol and vacancy bonus are incentivizing landlords to harass long-standing tenants from their homes. This is done by aggressively offering buyouts and by frivolous lawsuits. To fight these lawsuits and evictions, many tenants use their savings and retirement funds to pay legal fees. 
according to the Right to Counsel Coalition, 250,000 to 300,000 evictions are due to non-payment of rent. Many are among the more than 60,000 homeless people living in shelters. Often, by the time a tenant is eligible for SCREE or DREE, the rent is unaffordable. These programs freeze rents. They do not roll back rents. So tenants either cut back on medicine and food or move from their homes. Also, many registered rents of preferential and market rate leases are illegal. To remedy this, the statute of limitations must be extended and MCIs must be temporary. I thank the council for these resolutions and I hope that the state who has the ability to make these changes will do so to protect affordable housing and maintain the stability of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wakeham, do you have your testimony for submission? I, I do have to um, photocopy more of this and I will do that. Thank All right, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That buildings committee, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to testify, and I thank you for um, being the, the warriors for tenants. We really need your help. I'm Susan Steinberg. I'm president of the Stuyvesant Town Peter Cooper Village Tenants Association representing 28,000 residents and 11,230 units. And we are all supporting the pre-considered resolutions which are before you today. Um, despite the protections of rent regulations, <coughs> rents have risen dramatically in Peter Cooper Village and Stuyvesant Town. A one bedroom now starts at $3,156 per month. This is not affordable. When I moved in in 1980, I paid $250, and I realize there's a little time in between, but nevertheless. Um, in our city, the cost of living is 129% higher than the national average, and people's incomes are really not keeping up with the, uh, the rise in rents. As a result of the weakening of rent laws, every time they come up for renewal in Albany, um, and the skyrocketing of rents, our once stable community, is now filled with transients who double and triple up to make the rent and then leave at least renewal when the rent goes up. Thousands of units churn annually thanks to vacancy decontrol, vacancy bonuses, preferential rents, and major capital improvements that we pay for till death. And prefiguring all of these amendments and loopholes is the Erstadt Law, which snatched away New York City's control of its rent destiny. It's time to take back that control. The series of resolutions to repeal or limit um, the Albany uh, catalog of bad faith is really important to us. And as I said, the 28,000 residents of Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village support this. Um, a lot of our community has been uprooted. We're no longer stable. I haven't known my neighbors for the past 12 years because they change every two years when the rent is up. Community used to be very important to us. It's still important to us. Um, we want to be able to know our neighbors, not to have a constant churn. So once again, I thank all of you for your time and thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for allowing us this opportunity. Are there any questions by my colleagues? Yeah, Councilmember Williams. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's more, more comments that I wanted to state. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your testimony <coughs> and the work you do. Just have to give a special shout out to uh, Mike McKee, who has been a stalwart uh, in this journey for quite some time. Uh, these are issues I've been working on. I'm just calculating, I'm scared to say it's actually been almost two decades um, now been working on these issues. Um, I want to thank Mike for pointing out that it was not the Republicans who started this uh, drama. Um, and I'm, as I am, folks know, doing some things, I always point out there are Democrats who need to be held accountable for the state of housing and homelessness in this city and in this state. And we can't just blame it on the orange madness that's going on because there was fertile ground that was laid long before the orange craziness. Um, the governor in particular, and this is not hyperbole, uh, there's a lot of issues I have with him, but 
housing uh, is one of his most palpable failures across the state and in this city. He could have done so much to strengthen rent regulation in the city and rent regulations to the rest of the state. What he did with 421A uh, was just egregious to, to no end. Uh, he weakened, not only did he weaken it, he took it away from our ability to even uh, negotiate against rent regulation. This is appalling what this governor has done with rent regulations. Um, I'm happy to be supportive of all of these resolutions, and I ask the clerk to please add my name to all of them. I wish there was more uh, that this city can do. Uh, we're doing all that we can, and I think, I'm glad my colleagues, along with the chair and the speaker, are doing all that they can do. But the state really has to step up here. I hope uh, when the state comes back into Democrat control, that they pass the things that they say they would pass if the assembly passed it. <laughs> That's gonna be a big test to see what happens. It's easy to talk when you don't have the power. When you do have the power, we'll see what happens. But the governor has to provide leadership. He seems to be providing leadership the closer we get to September, so maybe we can push him here. And I also hope if we do uh, civil disobedience and uh, be disruptive of status quo things, which I will gladly take apart, uh, we should move it into some of the Republican districts um, that are not feeling the pressure. I'm happy to go there and disrupt some of those neighbors uh, so that maybe they can put pressure on uh, Flanagan and others as well. Uh, so I'm gonna be supportive of this. I don't know if I'll be able to wait until the vote, but I want to make sure I put my comments uh, on the record. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's push it. I mean, communities are being ravaged by, rent, by preferential rate in particular and rent regulation uh, and decontrol and all of those things, like literally ravaged. We have to do more on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Carnegie. I really just, uh, like Councilmember Williams, want to thank everyone for taking their time to come and testify today. And for the people who are about to testify, you guys are on the front lines doing the work. I especially want to thank um, Assembly Member, the representative from Assembly Member um, Harvey Epstein's office. I'm not shocked that this he's starting off doing exactly what we would hope he would do, living up to his word. Um, but Michael, I too want to lend my thanks for your pointing out how this all began in 1994. Um, it's incredibly frustrating that we've left ourselves in this sort of powerless situation. And it's a great reminder to all of us on the council that, you know, not to get strong-armed into doing something that, you know, we're told is not going to really affect people um, when, in fact, the implications are devastating. So thank you for continuing to remind us about that. Um, next time, you can also include the part about in 2010, which is the part I always love, and the five developers who in the middle of the night, uh, stole millions of dollars out of the city's pocket. Um, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. I just want to add my voice to the, to the chorus, uh, representing a district that in the 90s couldn't have fathomed a $2,000 rent uh, in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights, which is, that is now uh, below, the, I mean, that is the average, if you're lucky. So um, it's that vision and foresight that sometimes we need to pay attention to the advocates a little bit better. So I just want to thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Council Member Torres. Can I, can I ask a question? Because I, I see the repeal of vacancy decontrol as the holy grail. You know, without the repeal of vacancy decontrol, everything we do in the city, whether it's the right to counsel, MIH, all noble initiatives are tinkering at the margins. And so if we have a democratic wave uh, at the next election and a democratic Senate, what are the what are the pro, what are the actual prospects for the repeal of vacancy you control? Because you know more about the merits of the politics better than anyone. I think. Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, I think first of all, in response as a general response to the several of the comments, we should never underestimate the power of real estate money. That's what got them the votes in, in 1994 at the City Council. There were numerous city council members who made an absolute ironclad commitment to us at the time that they would vote no, who ended up voting yes. Most notably, Anthony Weiner, who was one of the few city council members who actually understood the long-term significance of this amendment and told us that he understood that this was not really the simple little amendment, but this was a 
uh, uh, the beginning of the dismantling of the rent regulation system. In the end, he ended up voting for it, and two years later um, introduced a bill that would have gutted code enforcement, which the Housing Committee under Archie Spigner tried twice to report out of committee, and twice we stopped it. Um, and then he ran for Congress in, in 1998 with a ton of real estate money. Um, and I think we should never, ever underestimate the ability of the real estate lobby to buy what it wants. And they do this in Albany all the time. The upstate um, senators of either party do not have rent regulation, unfortunately. We hope someday they will. But uh, they don't care about this issue one way or another. They really don't. Um, it's not something that they'll vote, either, whatever their leadership tells them to do, that's how they'll vote. So witness that virtually all of the Republican senators, with the exception of Kemp Hannon from Long Island, who's a real ideologue, they all vote to renew the rent laws periodically because that's the deal. Um, so about next year, I wish I could believe that Andrew Cuomo really means what he seems to be saying lately. And I wish I didn't feel um, that if he is reelected in November, that he will be serious about any of these issues next year. Um, this is clearly an election year conversion. Uh, there are two words to explain why he is now saying this, or his minions actually are saying it. Supposedly, he's going to be coming out with a platform at some point. And the first word begins with C, and the second word begins with N. Um, but um, if the Democrats take control of the state Senate, I believe we will have a real shot at getting some of these bills done, all of them, I hope. Um, but in 2010, when the Democrats had a one-vote majority in the state Senate, the real estate industry, the RSA, the Rent Stabilization Association, went to three Democratic senators and promised them $150,000 in campaign funds uh, if they would vote against two of our bills that came to the floor. One was the bill to close the preferential rent loophole, and the other was a bill to uh, restrict owner use evictions. Um, and they all three voted against uh, that bill, even though two of them we had helped, Tenants PAC had helped elect. Um, and they did indeed follow through on that pledge to give them $150,000 each. Two of them, for, uh, it was kind of uh, heartwarming to see that two of them lost anyway. Um, one of them is still in the, s in the Senate, David Valesky of Syracuse. Uh, and um, I, I, it's, it's not a slam dunk. You know what? Repeal of, home, repeal of Erstad and restoration of home rule is not a slam dunk. I tell people all the time, I tell tenant advocates all the time, don't assume that just because we can get home rule back, if we ever can, that we're going to win in the city council and the history is against us. Because if Erstat is repealed, 75% of the money that now goes to politicians in Albany goes to City Hall. They'll still have things they need in Albany, like 421A and stuff like that, but they will, they will be sending all of their campaign money to you guys. Um, and by the same token, having a Democratic majority in the state Senate is not a slam dunk. Uh, and I, uh, I want to finish by saying that if you really think about it, Andrew Cuomo did this to himself. He now is in a position where he cannot get 32 votes for anything that he says he wants to do, whether it's on this issue or other progressive issues. And the reason for that is that he, despite his promises, repeated promises, to veto any partisan reapportionment plan, in 2012, he, uh, in return for a dubious legislative package, which included an anti-labor union uh, pension bill, setting up a new lesser tier for new hires, he allowed both houses to redraw their own lines and allowed the Senate Republicans to create hyper-partisan gerrymandered lines that they have used to stay in, in power. Um, I'm sorry. I'm a little cynical. Uh, I've been down this road uh, too long, but uh, it's not going to be—it's not going to just happen. We're going to have to hold our friends in the Senate if they are in the majority. We're going to have to hold them accountable, and we're going to have to make it clear to our friends in the Assembly that it's not enough to just pass one-house bills every year and say and put out a press release 
you've got to actually use some leverage to force the other players to, to do this. A long-winded answer, but thank you for letting me get that off my chest. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilmember Rivera? Yes, thank you. I've um, prepared a very, very short statement on my bill. Of course, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Chair Cornegie and the members of the committee, Mike, Kathy, Rebecca, Susan. Thank you for all of your work. After the resolution, I probably won't be getting a lot of real estate checks coming in um, once, they, once they read it, but just know that I'm always open to communication and working with all the stakeholders involved. So with rental prices continuing to remain at sky high levels here in our city and with tenants often seeing rent increases of hundreds of dollars or more when their lease expires, it's clear that something has to change. That something is rent stabilization. Rent stabilization is the great equalizer in our city's fight against gentrification. Roughly one million New Yorkers go about their day with the financial security of knowing they won't be facing an egregious rent hike at the end of their lease. Unfortunately, that still leaves millions of New Yorkers in market rate apartments who worry about losing that basic human right, the right to a home. Excessive rent hikes and no right to a lease, resu a lease renewal leave so many New Yorkers in this position where they don't know what's going to happen. And these are middle class families who are struggling to make it. We have the opportunity right now to do the right thing and still thrive economically. So it's time for the state to do something bold. And I encourage all of my fellow council members to support my resolution calling on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that guarantees rent stabilization protections to all apartments in New York City. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you so much for your testimony and for your work and advocacy around these very germane issues to communities across the city. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mike, will you? Thank you, Councilmember Member Jonah, I, yeah. I apologize. Thank you. Um, I agree with you, and uh, first of all, Mike, you've committed your life to fighting uh, for tenants. Uh, it's a very worthy and notable cause, and I truly commend you on it. Yep, I just want to question, it's more than Albany that's to blame for this. And we know that realtors, landlords, will somehow figure out to make money. So if they can't make the money based on rent increases, they'll cut services because they have to have a balance at the end of the day. And hopefully it'll be a profitable one for them. Otherwise, they'll have to cut services further to make sure they, have a, they turn over a profit and able to meet their obligations. But one thing that never comes up in the discussions is the charges that are placed on or passed through the landlord to the tenant. Real estate taxes and water and sewer rates for New York City. Today, water and sewer rates are more expensive than fuel, averaging around $1,200 per apartment per year. Real estate taxes, about 3000 per apartment per year. That's $400 a month combined that a landlord pays back to the city in the form of real estate taxes and water and sewer. So city charges landlord, landlord passes on to tenant. Tenant pays landlord, landlord pays city. Who's the culprit in your mind? I think you raise a very interesting point, and I agree with you about real property taxes and water and sewer charges. I think the water board has been, um, this goes back 30 years, 25 years at least, uh, basically instead of bonding to pay for uh, enhancements to our water supply and protection of the watershed, the water board, the city water board has loaded everything into the rates, and, and that is why uh, water uh, and sewer charges have skyrocketed. This is especially a problem for HDFCs, low-income co-ops, who are, you know, basically, by definition, uh, the tenants in, or the shareholders in those buildings are um, low-income, and this, many of them are being slammed with this, as are 
some small landlords. Um, and as far as but you agree that might the charges get passed on to well, the yes, I'm tenant. Getting, and I'm tenant getting to right. that. I'm getting to that. Um, and as far as real property taxes goes, it's clear to anyone who observes uh, this system that mm -hmm. it's a very unfair system and that apartment buildings are over-assessed compared to single-family homes. And I believe the reason for that is that most tenants are not aware that when they write their monthly rent check, 25% of that is going to the city for real property taxes. And it's therefore easier to pass it on to the tenants from the city's point of view than it is to pass it on to homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, whether we'll ever see any kind of reform of our real property tax system is a big question, and I have my doubts, even though people talk about it all the time. I do want to point out to you, Council Member, that according to Department of Finance data, which is made available in the aggregate every year to the, the City Rent Guidelines Board uh, under Local Law 63, which requires owners of income producing property, including rent stabilized buildings, to report annually their income and expenses to the Department of Finance for purposes of real property assessments. Mm -hmm. um, but they make these data available in the aggregate to the Rent Guidelines Board, and they show that on average, Landlords of rent-stabilized properties in New York City are netting 42 cents on the dollar. Actually, it's 41.7% according to the report that was published in March. They, report, they, 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 re they publish this every year. Now, that's an average. It means some landlords are netting more and some landlords are netting less. But it means basically landlords are spending 58 cents of every dollar they collect on all cost of running their building including everything, all no, the operation maintenance. No, doesn't take into consideration mortgage loans. Excuse me, yeah. I haven't finished. Sorry. Uh, leaving 42 cents for debt service and profit. Mm -hmm. Now that's, in my view, an amazingly positive net. And while it is, at best, a surrogate for profit, you can't really tell if a building is profitable unless you look at the individual books for that building, which we don't have the ability to do. But net operating income is a very good surrogate for profit it's the best we've got, and it certainly paints a picture of a real estate industry that is doing, I'm sorry, pretty well. I, I beg you to tell me another industry that even approaches a 42% net. I, I can't, I, I don't know, I can't Supermarkets to operate on three to 5% right, margin. Mike, you, you're extremely knowledgeable, and again, I enjoy the um, conversation with you, but there's real points here. Uh, the next five years, New York City is projecting a $1 billion increase in real estate taxes. A large portion of those increases on top of what is currently being paid is going to be passed on to the very group, the very families and individuals that we claim to want to be helping through rent protections will be paying an unfair share of real estate taxes that will be included in their rent and passed through the landlord. You are correct. Year over year, billion dollar increases. Multiple family buildings, are, multiple dwelling buildings, are subsidizing home ownerships and other classes on real estate, the class fours that we have and not enough is being said or done to push back on the city. I want to add one more thing. Would you be, and we all know that New York City has become very unaffordable for many, uh, not even, including homeowners, uh, let alone renters that live on fixed income, and I wholeheartedly agree. Would you consider a means test, an income test, that would truly give the financial help to those families, similar to Scree and Dre, families that earn under $50,000 a year, the most vulnerable of our New York City residents, affording them the same rights that Scree and Dre tenants currently benefit from where it's a rent cap and no future rent increase will be uh, passed on to the tenant and the city would subsidize the landlord through a real estate tax credit. Would you be supportive of something? No, I would not agree to that. Tell it's me a, why. It's a ridiculous idea. First of all, the city couldn't afford it. It would cost a fortune. Scree and Dree already cost a lot. Mm. Um, and that's with 
even with many people who are eligible not applying for it, which is a big problem with screen injury. Um, but what this really is, this was, a, this was a proposal that was originally floated by uh, Pedro Espada when he was the chair of the Senate Housing Committee, um, and which was drafted by the real estate industry. And it's basically a trap to say that, well, we'll take care of the low-income people and the people who really deserve and, and need the protections of rent regulation. Once you enacted something like that, um, then you would have um, um, a rationale for just ending rent regulation, rent protections for all, all the other tenants. I believe that all tenants deserve and need rent and eviction protections. Rent regulation is not an affordability program. And the proof of that is that rent regulated uh, uh, rents are not affordable in many, many cases. In many cases, people are struggling to pay the rent stabilized rent. I know, th I have three friends who in the last eight or nine years have moved out of New York City and given up their rent stabilized apartments. One of them moved to New Jersey, one of them moved to North Carolina, and one of them moved to Texas because they could no longer afford to pay the rent stabilized rent. And so this is not an affordability pr uh, program. You cannot af guarantee affordability through rent regulation. What it is, is it is a program to level the playing field and to create a, a, a better balance between the power of landlords and the power of renters, including people going out into the market looking for apartments. And now you can't possibly find a rent stabilized apartment. You can only find a market rate apartment, which is wrong. Um, and if we get vacancy decontrol repealed, and if we are able to re-regulate the units that have been lost, we have to recognize that a huge amount of damage has been done to affordability. And you can't take all of that back. You can't recapture it all. So if we do succeed in repealing vacancy deregulation and re-regulating the units that have been lost, we're going to have much higher regulated rents than we used to have. And that is a shame, but it's the reality. So I would not agree with that, that proposal. I think it's a bad proposal. I think it is, it is, uh, a, it is a real estate proposal disguised as a pro-tenant proposal, and I oppose it. Uh, thank you for that, and I'd like to continue this with you, but uh, thousands of seniors and disabled are benefiting from those programs. And I think any help to those that are most vulnerable that could be homeless on a whim because they can't afford their rent or rent increases regardless of how low or high they are by RGB on a yearly basis. That's the, those are the families that government should seek to protect while offering the same protections to New Yorkers through rent stabilized apartments. But that is a very vulnerable population and any aid I would imagine should be supported by all that understand that, that those families are truly facing the, mo the most economic challenges because of the income that they have. Have you costed this out, council member? I have. Uh, well, I hope you aren't using Pedro Espada's cost estimates because they were no. utter nonsense. Um, he, I claimed, he claimed in 2010 that it would cost, I believe, $10 million after five years when in fact the Community Service Society did an analysis of this and said it would cost $5 billion a year in lost city revenue after five years. How much a year? $5 billion. No. That was an estimate at the time made by the Community Service Society, a very prominent non-profit organization. I think we certainly do need to do more to protect people from high rents and I think the solution to that is stronger rent protections and rent rollback, okay? Does the Rent Guidelines Board have the power to enact a rent rollback? They sure do. Are they likely to do it? Don't hold your breath, but they could do it. Mike, thank you for your time. Thank you to the panel. Thank so, you. So before you leave, Mr. McKee, I, 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 I got caught up in listening to your wealth of knowledge and forgot I had a hearing to chair. <laughs> so, but, but I do want to thank you. And, and honestly, this could go on for a while. And it's, and it's not just interesting banter. We are trying to make some resolutions for the tenants. So having that wealth of information is not wasted on this committee or myself. Thank you, and we hope that all of you will get involved in the fight between now and next June to 
close these loopholes and stop the erosion of affordable housing because that's what's at stake here. And I would remind you of the suggestion that each of you could organize town halls in your districts for the purpose of activating and mobilizing grassroots tenants to, because without that kind of grassroots pressure, we can't win. And Corey understands that. And I think most of you understand that. Thank you again for your testimony. I'm gonna call the next panel. Oh, Helen Rosenthal, again. Surely you I want to ask the question of somebody else on the panel. No, um, I mean, I just need to be clear about what's happened on the Upper West Side as an explanation of why I support these resolutions. Um, you know, exactly the story about your couple of friends who are leaving, I mean, I have uh, people in my, many people in my district, the only reason that we have middle income, what we can call middle income uh, people on the Upper West Side is because of rent regulation. And if we lost those units, then the Upper West Side becomes an area where you have the very rich and the very poor. And any macroeconomist uh, would tell you that uh, our, our country can't survive on uh, that, that can't continue on that situation where you have the very rich and the very poor. And we need the middle class in order and, and opportunities to pull up lower income people to the middle class in order for our country to survive. So I would caution anyone from making sort of bad public policy decisions based on a couple of bad apples who are truly outliers who perhaps play the system. If we're gonna be making policy based on those people, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. And lastly, in terms of property taxes, you know, I do think um, that property taxes unfairly, as it's structured now, the algorithm unfairly taxes uh, condo and co-op, uh, under taxes condo and co-op owners and over taxes single family homes. And I would ask my colleagues that when we're talking about property tax reform, which the mayor has promised to do, that they are willing to have an open mind about possibly increasing taxes on single family homes because inevitably that will be one of the outcomes of true property tax reform. Although I would argue that with assessment values going up, which is what's causing everyone's taxes to go up, not because the city is increasing the percent on property taxes, but simply because assessments are going up. We need to recognize that what the landlords are doing is simply taking advantage of, of the markets. And on one hand, we have to appreciate that's what they're doing. We live in a capitalist country. On the other hand, we are a social society that believes that everyone needs to have a home be able to go to public school, have shelter, and rent regulation is the system that we have. So our only option is to undo ERSTAT, bring all this back to the city where it belongs, and uh, allow New York City to make the choices that it wants to do, which we know is to protect our rent regulated tenants. Um, so I just want to thank you for your um, testimony and for your fact-based uh, testimony because the incentive, the financial incentive on behalf of the um, building owners that Rebney re represents is strong. And you are right. They are using their their money for the, you know, to influence the financial gains of who they represent. And that's problematic if most of the people are not being fairly represented. So thank you very much. I just want to uh, respond to one point you made, which is about 
um, one, one, two, and three family homes being under tax, that's generally true. But I think you have to recognize there are low income homeowners and you can always incorporate something like a circuit breaker into the system so that based on income, people can get a break because there are indeed many low income homeowners in the city. Not all homeowners are affluent, although most of them are. I, I'm, I guess I was thinking about my district, but you're right, yeah, citywide. Yeah. And um, I hope that when we do property tax reform, we are not, our hands are not tied by REBNY um, in order to change the algorithm altogether. I think you need to talk to the other end of City Hall about that. Uh, uh, just for the record, I represent one of the districts that the um, homeowners there are actually house rich and cash poor. So with estimated values of $2.5 million and people living on fixed incomes, yeah. that we're the epitome of, yeah. of that. There's an old saying, you can't eat equity. So the appreciation of the value of a house just doesn't do people any good if they don't have an adequate income. I think this is, oh, oh I just want to acknowledge um, we've been joined by Council Member Chin. Council Member, do you have a question? Thank you so much for your testimony. And what seemed like a grilling, but it wasn't, Mike. Uh, I'll call the next panel. Ellen Davidson, Delsenia Glover, and Jenny Laurie. Thank you. You can begin whenever you're settled. Good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Delcenia Glover, and I am Director of Education and Organizing at Tenants and Neighbors. In this capacity, I also serve as the Campaign Manager for the Alliance for Tenant Power, a coalition of organizations working to strengthen the rent laws for rent-regulated tenants. Thank you. Uh, I am here today to testify in support of the list of bills being voted on today regarding preferential rents, revealing vacancy deregulation, rent control relief, the vacancy bonus, and the unnumbered bills to extend rent regulation to unregulated apartments and extend the statute of limitations for rent overcharges. Just a word about uh, my organization, Tenants and Neighbors is comprised of two affiliate organizations, the Information Service and the Coalition that share a common mission to build a powerful and unified statewide organization that empowers and educates tenants, preserves affordable housing, livable neighborhoods and diverse communities, and strengthen tenant protections. The information service organizes tenants in at-risk re regulated and subsidized buildings, helping them to preserve their homes as affordable housing. The coalition is a 501c4 membership organization that does legislative organizing to address the underlying causes of loss of affordability. Our membership organization has over 3,000 dues paying members, thousands of tenants who are and will continue to be affected by what happens with the rent laws this legislative session and next year when the rent laws come up for renewal. Rent regulation, as you know, is the largest system of affordable housing in New York for low and moderate income tenants and is largely concentrated in historic communities of color that are now rapidly gentrifying. Tenants and Neighbors has been organizing and working with tenants and tenant associations in rent regulated buildings for many years. We have seen the loss of tens of thousands of rent regulated units due to these loopholes in the law and the devastating effects that that loss has had on our communities. We have also seen tenants living in rent regulated units who are increasingly unable to afford to pay the rent and many are paying more than 50% of their income in rent, including the elderly. 
This highlighting of these pieces of legislation by the Housing and Buildings Committee and the City Council is particularly significant right now as we approach one year out from re the rent law renewal of 2019. We in the movement for housing justice are very pleased to have the support of the City Council and will look forward to your support as we move into next year. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Jenny Laurie. I'm the Executive Director of Housing Court Answers. Uh, housing Court Answers staffs information tables in the New York City uh, five county housing courts, and we run a hotline for tenants facing eviction because they owe back rent, and we do trainings for advocates on eviction prevention programs and on a variety of housing topics. Um, Every year, about 200,000 tenants in New York City are sued for non-payment of rent and get hauled into housing courts. And the one piece of legislation that I'd like to focus on today is the, um, or the two pieces really, is repeal of vacancy decontrol and closing the preferential rent loophole. And I very much want to thank this committee, um, Council Member Carnegie and uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for your great leadership on uh, making strengthening the rent laws a real um, prominent piece of your agenda for low-income tenants or for tenants in the in the coming years. Um, I think it's vitally important for uh, preventing evictions, and that's what my organization is all about. Um, these days, it seems like half of the tenants who come to our table in the Bronx have preferential rents. They don't always know what it means, and they don't always know whether it's legal or what it is, but they understand that they have something that really blocks them from asserting their rights and blocks them from housing, from feeling stable in their housing. Um, yesterday, I was filling in on our hotline because we had a couple people out sick, and, I, and a woman called, and she needed money for back rent, and I asked her, as we always do, are you rent stabilized? And she said, no, I have a rent that is pre-rental. And I said, pre-rental, do you mean preferential? And so she said, yes, that's it. And I said, but you're, you don't think your rent stabilized? And she said, no, I'm not. I have a preferential rent. And, um, and it's true, right? So she's not, she is rent stabilized, technically, that apartment is. But if the landlord decides, which the landlord might very well, since she's been behind on the rent, not to renew the preferential rent, um, she's facing a, a rent increase. What she thought she was facing is a rent increase of $300 a month. Um, who knows whether that was legal or not, I couldn't tell over the phone. But she's absolutely right, she's not rent stabilized. She's, a, she's the equivalent of a market rate tenant. Um, a recent Community Service Society uh, report found that, um, revealed that in 2017, half of poor renters reported being unable to afford a $25 monthly increase in rent and that near poor and moderate income households were just as bad off. For near poor, it was 47%, and for uh, moderate income, it was 40% of people said they couldn't afford a $25 increase. We know from the Housing and Vacant Survey that city tenants, rent-regulated tenants, have very high rent burdens with one-third of tenants paying over 50% of their incomes in rent, and we know that about a third of the city rent-regulated apartments or we guess that a third of the rent, uh, city rent regulated apartments have a preferential rent. So those three things combined are creating a really impending disaster for tenants um, who really uh, were facing a huge eviction crisis as prices increase in neighborhoods, particularly low income neighborhoods across the city. Um, so I would urge the council to support closing the preferential rent loophole, and of course, all the other resolutions that are before you today. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Ellen Davidson. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society, um, and I'm coming here in support of the resolutions that are before this committee today. Um, I feel like I've been here uh, for years testifying about the housing crisis in New York City. I feel like the first time, I think the first time I testified about the housing crisis in New York City, Council Member Perkins was Council Member Perkins. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome back. Um, and, you know, back then I thought it was bad. Um, and 
it is astounding to me uh, that in all that time, things have only gotten worse. I mean, I think I used apoplectic terms back then, and, and, I, and I am using apoplectic terms now. I, it's just hard to imagine how things could get worse. Um, a recent report from the Coalition of the Homeless um, looked at apartments that were affordable to people who were low income um, and looked at the mismatch between how many people we have in New York City who are low income and how many apartments that are affordable to those people who are low income. Um, and they found that in 1999, there were over a million um, households in, that lived in New York City who needed apartments that rented for under $800. Um, and at the time, there were 1.3 million apartments in New York City that rented for under $800. Today, um, as the economy has changed, we now have um, about 867,000 households who need apartments that rent for under three, uh, rent for under $800 in order for those apartments to be affordable. And according to the HVS, there are now 349, 862 apartments available for these low-income New Yorkers. So we lost a million apartments in New York City that rented for under $800 in a little less than 20 years. And that's why we have a housing crisis. Um, and so um, from our perspective as the Legal Aid Society, uh, an immense amount of our clients live in rent-regulated houses, housing, um, and the, the loopholes in the laws have made their lives miserable. Um, beyond the harass extreme harassment they face where landlords uh, uh, do such things as come into their apartment building, apartments and um, use sledgehammers to get rid of their kitchens and bathrooms in order to force them out, or get rid of staircases um, in order to force them out, or the much more uh, ordinary um, experience that our clients have, which is they don't have heat and hot water during the winter, um, and the landlords are hoping uh, that they will pick up and get tired and leave. Um, the other which is you know, a huge problem, and where do they go? The HVS found that the median asked for rent is now 1875. Um, the other problem that we're seeing with preferential rents is we now go into buildings with horrific conditions, um, because as lawyers, one of the things we do is we work with tenants to do group HPs. So as a group, the tenants can go and ask the court to <coughs> order the judge to correct housing code violations. Um, and we go into buildings, and huge majorities of the tenants in those buildings are afraid to ask their landlords to follow the law. We, we cannot get clients to agree to participate in a group HP because they have preferential rents, and they know if they assert their rights, their right to a renewal lease is gone. Um, and so their choice is to have a, ha a home, you know, a roof over their heads that might be leaking, but a roof over their heads, um, or stand up in court and say to the judge, I just want my landlord to follow the law. So um, all of the loopholes that have been created in the rent laws um, have made life uh, miserable <coughs> for New York City tenants. Um, and I want to thank this New York City Council, the Council, this committee, Chair Carnegie, um, for uh, holding this hearing, for passing these resolutions, for fighting for New York City tenants. Um, and uh, I hope I'll see you all in Albany over the next, uh, uh, what, 13 months, um, because that's where I'll be. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much all for your tes their testimonies and for the hard work you do on behalf of people who so much need your advocacy. Thank you. So we're going to at this point ask uh, Billy Morton to call the roll. Billy Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on housing and buildings. All items are coupled. Chair Cornegie. I vote aye. Cabrera. 
Chin. I rely on all, and can you please add my name to um, the results as co-sponsor? Thank you. Rosenthal. I vote aye on all and ask that you add my name to all of these resolutions as co-sponsor. Thank you. Torres. Aye on all and please do the same for me. Add my name to the resolutions. Gordenchik. I and all except 1932, 1935, and 1937. Perkins. I, I rely on all uh, free consider resolutions. Would like my name to be added as a supporter, as a sponsor, and it's good to be back. <laughs> Rivera. I vote aye on all. Please add my name to all resolutions as a co-sponsor. We're going to keep the roll open for the next 15 minutes. So all items on today's agenda have been adopted by the committee by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions with the exceptions of pre-considered land use items, temporary numbers 1932, 35-37 are adopted by the committee, six in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions.